Dajahao. Uh, my name is Daniela Rus, and um, so um, you have heard this morning about amazing work from MIT about understanding the mysteries of the universe and mysteries of life towards a better world. But you can't really understand artificial intelligence at MIT without knowing a little bit of where we come from. So imagine this. It is 1956. The world looks very different uh, than today, especially in technology. And a young MIT professor by the name Marvin Minsky, the guy with glasses in the middle, decides to gather his friends and off they go to the woods of New Hampshire where they spend a few weeks um, talking and walking. And when they emerge from the woods, they announce to the world that they have coined a new field of study, artificial intelligence, the science and engineering of creating machines that have human-like characteristics in how they move, how they speak, uh, how they play games, and even how they learn. And since that point in time, MIT has made tremendous contributions to artificial intelligence, uh, to, um, to intelligence-like capabilities for machines. And the dream to create increasingly more autonomous and capable machines that are smart and obedient and support us with cognitive and physical tasks continues. Now, to make the big AI dream possible, we need to solve the big AI challenge. And this is how do we create bodies and brains for intelligent machines? So machines have to have bodies that are capable of the tasks we wish them to do, and brains that are capable of controlling the bodies to do those tasks. Now, at MIT, as part of the MIT um, Intelligence Quest, uh, we are pushing the boundaries on creating a machine a brains. And these machine brains may be inspired by the human uh, cognition, or they may be uh, developed as engineered computation, uh, engineered computation to optimize the task. And since right now we don't know so much about um, the brain uh, and how the brain works, the vast majority of our algorithms uh, are driven by mathematics and physics. And we will continue to make progress to make these algorithms more powerful. Now, as we learn more about the human brain, we will be able to also develop na uh, nature-inspired algorithms. And as we experiment with these algorithms, we hope to generate hypotheses for our neuroscience uh, colleagues, uh, because if we can create a machine that does a task in a certain way, maybe there is a natural system that does the same thing. So the MIT quest for intelligence um, is really about um, uh, creating nature-inspired algorithms um, and creating engineered algorithms and understanding the human brain. Now, the AI brain is a collection of implemented algorithms that pr provide support for cognitive tasks by delivering machine autonomy at rest, and physical tasks by delivering machine autonomy in motion. And advances are taking place in three fields simultaneously. Robotics puts computation in motion and gives machines the ability to move. Artificial intelligence gives machines uh, the ability to see, to hear, to communicate like uh, humans. And machine learning cuts across um, robotics and AI and aims to learn from and make predictions on uh, data. And today's, uh, in today's landscape, all fields that have data can benefit by the latest and greatest advances in machine learning. Medicine is a great example. Machines today can look at more radiology scans in a day than a radiologist will see in a lifetime. And a new AI-based approach was tasked with reviewing images of lymph node cells and diagnosed them as cancer or not cancer. The AI uh, system made 7.5% error as compared to the humans' uh, error at 3.5%. But working together, the humans and the machines achieved 0.5% error. This is 80% improvement in the accuracy of the system, which is extraordinary. And this is because people are better at some things and machines are better at others. Um, people have um, hearts and wisdom, and machines have chips and speed. Now, Today, these techniques are deployed in the most advanced cancer centers of the world, but imagine a day where everyone has access to these systems, where overworked doctors or rural doctors can use these systems um, to deliver the most um, advanced, uh, most personalized care uh, to their patients. Now, 
um, humans and cars, uh, uh, humans and machines working together are also making better transportation systems. And in a recent um, study, we developed a new algorithm that is able to um, tackle the traffic congestion problem. And we've applied it to traffic demands in New York City. We have shown that um, the traffic demand in New York City that is currently supported by 14,000 taxis that are constantly roaming around the streets can be done with 3,000 taxis for approximately uh, the same level of performance. And I wonder what this algorithm would do for Beijing traffic. Uh, I would love to have uh, something like that in place for my next trip here. So think about traffic um, in, uh, uh, with fewer cars, lower pollution, lower sound, in general, improve quality of life for the entire city. So another advance we are uh, making in, um, in transportation uh, is, uh, is uh, automating uh, driving, because we believe that autonomous cars will absolutely ensure that there will be no traffic fatalities. We believe that with autonomous vehicles, we will provide our parents and grandparents with higher quality of life in their retirement. And all of us will be able to go anywhere, anytime. And here you can see the MIT um, autonomous car, which is, uh, in this case, the Toyota Prius, uh, extended with a number of sensors and computers. Now, um, this car operates um, uh, just like all other autonomous uh, vehicle solutions using a pipeline um, that essentially breaks up the autonomy uh, driving problem into several sub-problems and then solves each problem individually. So uh, in particular, um, the pipeline starts by looking at feedback from the sensors. From this feedback, you, you can tell where the obstacles are. You can localize the car relative to the obstacles. You can tell the car to, how to figure out where to go and then execute. So now, the problem is that um, for this um, uh, approach to solving the autonomous driving problem, um, this pipeline is challenging because each um, because it needs explicit modules and solutions for each type of road situation. For example, for nighttime driving, or country roads versus city roads, or rainy weather, snowy weather, and sunny weather. And there's just too many parameters to manually uh, tune. So instead, uh, what we can do is, uh, um, is uh, take a lesson from how humans drive. And in a new uh, approach to the autonomy uh, driving, we've learned the entire uh, intermediate pipeline uh, by observing human drivers. And so in this case, uh, what we do is we look at um, single uh, images. Uh, we look at how humans steer uh, given an environment. And uh, we learn, um, and so we look at what the environment looks like and how the human st uh, steers. And uh, just look at this car, which is taking its first ride in the countryside. This car was trained uh, in the city in Cambridge. And then we took it for a ride on this country road. Um, and uh, you can see this car driving uh, around 25 miles an hour pretty smoothly. In fact, if I compare this to my first drive, I would say that this is way, way smoother than what I was able to do. Now, we can take the same technology for autonomous driving and map it onto wearables to provide uh, solutions for a very important problem. And this important problem is providing blind and visually impaired people with better ways of experiencing the world. So here we take the sensors and we map them onto belts and necklaces, and then we sew the computers uh, inside clothing. And with these systems, um, we can, uh, we can uh, explain to, uh, we can talk with, young, uh, with uh, blind uh, users and describe a fabulous window display or an obstacle behind the user uh, or the presence uh, of a friend. And uh, in fact, uh, we have been able to, um, we have, uh, I guess we're missing a movie here. Um, we have actually implemented the system and uh, we have shown that it can be used indoors and outdoors. And we believe that uh, using the system, um, uh, we might be able to also provide feedback to neuroscientists um, because uh, advances, because, because uh, with feedback to neuroscientists, we might be able to get at the essence of blindness and perhaps even find ways uh, to repair it. 
Now, while advancing uh, robotics uh, has the potential to provide feedback to neuroscientists, advances in neuroscience are also providing feedback to roboticists. And here is an example. Oh, okay, so, um, right, this is our blind user. I guess the, sh uh, the slides got a little bit shuffled anyway, so this is the evidence that our uh, blind navigation system um, works. So, um, so here's the uh, neuroscience uh, example. Um, now, neuroscientists uh, introduced a brain activity sensor called the EEG cap. This is a pretty sparse sensor. It consists of 48 um, uh, sensors that are scattered ar um, around the head. And um, these sensors uh, record brain activity. Um, but what they record is actually very noisy. Now, uh, in a recent uh, project, my group uh, showed that there is one sensor, uh, there is one signal um, that we can detect reliably despite the noise. And this signal is a signal that we all make, no matter what our native tongue, and um, no matter um, where we live, and it's not trained. And it's the signal we make when we notice that something is wrong, the you are wrong signal. Okay, so this signal has a, uh, is, uh, is uh, well-defined, has a, a very clear signature, and it's localized, and it's called the error-related potential. And here you can see a user um, that takes advantage um, of our ability to detect the sensor to correct the mistake of a robot from the di a distance. Now, in this case, a robot is tasked uh, to sort paint cans in a bin labeled paint and wire spool in a bin labeled wire. The robot randomly goes to one box or another. And when the robot makes the wrong mistake, the brain um, uh, of the user detects, oh, this is wrong. And uh, that gets detected in about 100 milliseconds and can be used uh, to um, get the robot to correct its mistakes. So you just saw a move where the wire spool went to the uh, paint bin and uh, the robot uh, got embarrassed uh, when it received the scolding si uh, um, signal uh, from the user. So this is really um, uh, exciting because you can see several examples of how neuroscience, computer science, and robotics come together to supplement and augment uh, each other. Now, uh, with these technologies, uh, we have uh, great hope for a better world because with these technologies, we imagine reducing and eliminating car accidents. We imagine uh, better diagnosing, monitoring, and treating disease. Uh, democratizing computing, keeping our information private and safe, transporting people and goods um, faster and more uh, and, and um, less um, uh, expensively, and in general, uh, allowing people to focus on the big picture, strategic thinking, uh, while machines can take on the routine tasks for us. Yes, yes.